we organized this workshop um, because I'm, I'm a GCMS or gas chromatographer, mass spectrometry um, guy in that sense, and the technologies, what Dr. Günther was talking about, MRI or NMR, is another very important analytical method, and it seems that we need to meet and we need to um, combine these technologies for biochemical or biological interpretations. So the way we assemble this uh, workshop is practically to go through some basic concepts that we are, hopefully in the short future, we will be able to uh, provide for doctors and, and uh, care providers to actually use these methodologies and technologies, especially MRI images, with some very powerful biochemical interpretations. Now, I have to admit I'm not an NMR or MRI expert, yet um, being in analytical chemistry and biological interpretations, I find very interesting the biochemical possibilities of biochemical interpretations, just looking at some of the MRI spectra and knowing how they are generated, it seems to be that we are exploring a very useful uh, tissue phenotyping tool. And I, I'd like to cover some of the basic uh, uh, aspects of this uh, uh, methodology. I just gave a talk about this at uh, UCLA, and I have exchanged um, email messages regarding the basic concepts that we are covering here with, with many investigators, um, including Dr. Roth and, and her colleagues, as well as Gabor and, and our colleagues at UCLA. And um, <clears throat> I think we are at a point where we can now develop some common understanding of how these uh, MRI images are generated and from the basic technology point of view, what do they mean from, for, for a biochemist or a physician? Now this seems, now this is a coconut, so um, this has nothing to do with medicine at this point other than coconut water is very healthy. Um, and actually it's a, no, it's a big, there's like coconut waters everywhere, especially in the U.S. Um, now it's not the water necessarily, but actually the pulp the fat um, that, uh, that caught my attention. And this is where we brought in um, uh, clinicians and, and, and biochemists and uh, mass spectrometry experts because the fat seems to be always the shiny, on T1 images, the shiny, um, the shiny element, yet water is, is darker somewhat. And um, this is a T1 um, MRI. Um, application, and I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about how these images are generated, and then we'll develop some kind of a biochemical understanding of what, what a coconut, um, like how the coconut looks like in an MRI as, as it does. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Felix Bloch, I hope I say it right, Bloch? Bloch. Bloch. In 1946, came up with this very simple concept that is <clears throat> actually each um, material or biological complex or physical complex has a magnetic field of its own and actually it's composed of its particles and actually you can divert this magnetic field and there's a time where these elements recover uh, back to their original position, and this time is reflecting on the composition of this material. And <clears throat> obviously this MRI, NMR or MRI, that what they use as far as generating a, a, an image uses various sequences are available, but the T1 sequence is what reflects the regrowth of the longitudinal or, or the, the, the original um, magnetic field in and within the sample. You, you have to imagine this as a, as a bunch of kids are playing on the, on the kindergarten and the teachers are kind of keeping them under control. That's the magnetic field. And all of a sudden you throw some chocolate in and these kids are running and then 
once they picked up all the chocolate, they have to kind of align themselves again uh, as the teachers are watch watching. So eventually, after the radio frequency pause is applied, these atoms, or hydrogens in this case, return to their original position. In the meantime, they reflect or, or, or radiate, let's just sim for simplicity, radiate back the, the radio frequency that they absorb and, and uh, what is characteristic of, of their chemical structure. Um, hydrogen is the main primary target of uh, MRI, and this is how we form magnetic re resonance images. So um, MRI machines use uh, very narrow monitoring of hydrogens, either on water or hydrogens that are associated with fatty acids or that are embedded in fatty acids, and they will behave differently. And <coughs> this is what this, 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 this uh, slide will describe. The T1 relaxation, the relaxation we mean is when the molecules after a radio frequency signal return to their or original position, or better to say the time that it takes to return to their original position. It seems like then, in fact, because there are carbon-hydrogen bonds, there are going to be certain uh, spectra that come from fat that is related to these relaxation properties. And as you can see, that um, the hydrogen atoms, as they nestle, as they are in, 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 in these carbon bonds, they have, uh, uh, and, and they sit on long carbon chains, which can shield Proto, uh, electrons and, 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 and obviously the protons, they, they can actually show a very unique image because of their saturation and also because of their uh, chemical bonds with, with carbons. Water, on the other hand, it's, it's, it's more, um, uh, tend to, to actually resonate differently and there is actually a different shielding effect. Now, <clears throat> mass spectrometrists use this T1 value to actually differentiate fat from water, and simply is because fat has, has a much shorter um, um, uh, T1 time than those for water, and hydrogen protons of water resonate slightly faster, and that's, that's, that's of the water protons. And this difference in, in resonance frequency is known as the chemical shift, water fat chemical shift, which is about three and a half parts per million. And you can calculate from that, from that, from that shift what is the um, MRI consequences of this as far as monitoring certain energy and, and, and megahertz levels, but actually you can see what this shift is when you look at T1 and T2 weighed images, and T1 is when you look at fat more than you look at water. And this is what MRI is about. It's a very specific Nuclear, nuclear magnetic resonance application, when you look at fat and water in tissues or in objects that you are interested in studying, and you look at their composition based on the, the proton or hydrogen signals. Um, now, <clears throat> hydrogen has a, a, an isotope called deuterium, and this um, atom here is going to be mentioned many times in, in our in our conference, yet what we are interested in uh, primary is that what is the difference if hydrogen is replaced by a deuterium in a chemical bond? Let's say hydrogen is, is, is bound to a carbon. Actually, one of the key findings that we know from, from chemistry is that actually it's, it, it breaks slower if you have a, a carbon deuterium binding, and this is about a factor of, of, of seven. So <clears throat> obviously, hydrogen and deuterium have strong isotope effects, and obviously when it comes to um, NMR, uh, the, the deuterium may have a, a, an effect in the latest. The question is how it gets in the latest, and what is the consequence of that. The other paper that I would like to point out is that um, the isotope effect of deuterium that has been studied in ice, in cube ice, um, the hydrogens, and this is actually a, an ice cube, one, one uh, structure of the ice cube where 
you can see these uh, hydrogens and, and oxygens frozen, and they actually have this tunneling effect where these hydrogens move between two um, oxygens, and they are never in the middle. They kind of move um, between the, the two atoms, and, and you can see that does not really require energy, or you don't have to invest energy in the process. There are two things that are key. Um, these hydrogen movements are always together. So if this hydrogen moves towards to the left, then all the rest will move to the left unless you actually put a deuterium into the system. And that can actually make 100 hydrogens not to be able to move anymore in a coordinated, coordinated fashion. So in ice, as it's shown by German scientists, uh, um, that the, the effect of deuterium is very strong. It's about a factor of 100, meaning that one deuterium atom can affect 100 hydrogen molecules and their resonance in a very close uh, percentage or, or uh, 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 neighborhood, meaning that um, deuterium, even if it's very low in nature as far as its concentrations because of its isotope effect in various hydrogen bonding systems, this is just ice because it's easy to study tunneling, but actually in DNA and RNA and fat, there are um, very serious uh, and very uh, important biochemical and biological implications. But obviously, deuterium in hydrogen bonding systems, and, and this is what these authors are suggesting, that this process needs to be explored and studied further. And this is obviously one very important um, guiding uh, 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 idea for us to study um, deuterium and, and the effect of, of deuterium in the latest. Uh, and the latest is NMR. Latest is where, where hydrogens kind of um, relax back after the radio signal was given. Um, and this is the time that we, we measure in a T1 sequence. And actually, uh, we are, th this is why we organized this workshop, just to talk about deuterium and how it affects the latest and if, if it can be used for a tissue fin as a tissue phenotyping tool. Um, now, this is, these are eggs, and um, these were actually, um, these images were produced by uh, Dr. Peter Mansfield, and you might know this laboratory very well because it's in your close uh, proximity, Dr. Gunther, but um, he got the Nobel Prize in, 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 um, in medicine back in 2003, um, Dr. Mansfield, and it's because of his contribution to MRI um, diagnostics. So, <clears throat> and literally, if you go to their website, which is called the Six Symbols, they throw uh, butter, strawberries, pepper, anything that moves or can, you can buy, they just throw in the MRI and they, gen they generate these images and in this case, it's actually X. And <clears throat> so I was interested in finding out how the egg yolk, which is fat, and the egg white, which is in the surrounding, obviously we all know how egg looks like. I don't have to explain that to anybody. But the, my question was, does this image correlate with the deuterium content that the egg would um, actually uh, show once we oxidize it. So to do that, we actually have to turn our laboratory into little mitochondria because we wanted to know what is the hydrogen deuterium ratio in the egg white and egg yolk, and we can do that. The Hungarian Academy of Sciences, uh, um, Academy of Sciences and, and Geochemistry Laboratory can do that for us. And the way we do this, or Dr. Forish is doing this, is practically five milligram of egg white and egg yolk were placed into um, these, uh, carbo uh, these copper oxide beads and then comp completely oxidized. And this is what happens in the mitochondria. Substrates are completely oxidized, and complex four would actually generate water from these, from these uh, egg white and yolk dry material, and then you can transfer the hydrogen onto another catalyst, and the CO2 is sucked out, and eventually you can use this hydrogen 
uh, to determine using isotope ratio mass spectrometry, you can determine the, the deuterium and the hydrogen ratio in the egg white and egg yolk, and you can compare that um, with the image of the egg uh, that we got from the internet uh, from the MRI laboratory. Now, what is really interesting about the egg is that <coughs> if you look at the egg, the water content of the egg in the beginning, this is an experiment where actually hands were drinking uh, deuterium depleted water, but let's just focus on day zero when the eggs are native, meaning that there's no deuterium introduction or there's no deuterium depletion yet. But you can see that the water of the egg white and the water of the egg yolk is, is, is very similar. It's about 145 uh, parts per million as far as deuterium concentration goes, and it's very similar with the egg white. So the question is, um, is the egg white we know is protein, is the peptide or the protein bonds would actually use water, or actually produce water that equilibrates with the, with the water in the egg, and why the egg yolk is actually lower in deuterium in the beginning. Obviously, this is because there are deuterium depleting processes in the mitochondria, which we're going to talk about more later. But what is more interesting, and this is, I think, uh, what I'd like to um, share with you, is that if you get the image, analyze the image of an egg, looking at the background, which is here, number one, and looking at the white and the yolk, and you, you generate the, the, the luminescence of these, of these, uh, um, of, of, of these uh, egg white and egg yolk, and, and you look at the, the color intensity and, and the luminescence, then you can see that there is a difference which is about 20%, um, the egg yolk being, being uh, more bright. Now, if you compare this to deuterium content of the egg, which we measured using isotope ratio mass spectrometry, you might be surprised that actually, <coughs> as a negative image of the egg white, having uh, less deuterium is more bright, and the egg, the egg yolk being more bright, and the egg white uh, being darker as it has more deuterium, and this number is, is, is very close as far as inverse, obtaining inverse images using MRI of the, of the deuterium content. Now, <clears throat> these are totally independent um, images um, and analysis by a computer of the image or luminescence and also measuring uh, deuterium content in egg white and egg yolk uh, using precise isotope ratio mass spectrometry methods. So it seems that um, deuterium content of the yolk and white has a very close correlation of the MRI intensity or the brightness that we obtain um, uh, from, from, from eggs. So <clears throat> the question that we asked with Gabor, and we just wrote a, a, a paper in Molecular Cell about this phenomenon, that is, is there a comp compartmentalized NADPH synthesis where this hydrogen uh, is transferred to, to, to fat differently than the hydrogen content in, in proteins, and that can actually reflect on different water pools of the cell, which we know there's, there's metabolic water and we know there's, there's uh, uh, water in the environment or cellular water, so the question was how we can actually consolidate these biochemical knowledges or biochemical information uh, talking about hydrogen or deuterium transfer in the biological system is, and how can, how can this be used as a tissue phenotyping tool. Um, I'm not going to talk about the clinics much, but usually tumors show up as a darker image. And then you can see that uh, T1 sequences seems like if you look at the imaging uh, capabilities of MRI and it, it, at the latest, if it's deuterium loaded, we believe, and obviously we are confirming this, this using data uh, from other sources as well as um, looking at different biological materials, but our goal is to determine deuterium content of tumors and eventually um, 
correlate those with the image uh, that we see in MRI and give this bio biochemical information to the hands of clinicians by, um, uh, by being able to, to uh, comment on, on metabolic water production, which is a mitochondrial function, and I'm not going to cover this in my talk right now, but tomorrow what that is, what, what, how biochemical processes contribute to water production in the mitochondria. So um, it seems that deuterium can be seen on MRI, not directly, but indirectly. And it's not very abundant, obviously, but, and it does not give a useful radio frequency signal, but it, it, because of its, its isotope effects and because of its effect in the latest, there is a close correlation in isotope deuterium de de uh, deter uh, measurements and image uh, intensities on MRI images. And uh, <coughs> we hope now, as we understand biochemistry um, and the deuterium depleting me met metabolism um, of biochemical processes, we hope that we will be able to uh, give uh, clinical tools to the hands of, of radiologists by understanding image density on MRI and deuterium content of tissues and what caused deuterium loading into various human tissues and how can that be interpreted using MRI sequences. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Brett Hundley who was just uh, staying in our um, house in Los Angeles. He's now the new quarterback of the Green Bay Packers and Dominic knows about him. Because, are, are you a South Florida fan or? Uh, you are. Yeah. You, you have to be, I know. And Dr. Roach, she told me in the taxi cab she is too, so I just don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, a little bit more about his involvement in this research. But Gabor is a, is a, is a collaborator. Um, Agi funded some of this research. Dr. Lee is my colleague at UCLA and Esther process the visual for, for, this, uh, uh, for this talk. And this is the funding and some additional reading. And this is Brett before he was drafted to the Green Bay Packers. And um, the New England Patriots were fighting over him, but actually we are working with him now to understand his mitochondria and his deuterium depletion and his MRI a little bit better but obviously he's a very fine and very kind athlete and I just wanted to show this picture. So thank you very much. <laughs>